My topic this afternoon uh, is skyscrapers and business cycles. Right? And I think first we need to deal with the obvious question, and that is, when Mark Thornton literally wrote the book about skyscrapers and business cycles, you can buy it downstairs. I highly recommend that you buy it downstairs. Why are you giving the talk about skyscrapers and business cycles? And that's a good question. I have nothing else to say about that. It's a good question. Right? So, I, I guess I can perhaps you know, show the man behind the curtain a little bit in terms of the process. I was sent an email earlier as, we were, as you know, this was being planned. Uh, and I was told we would like you to give the MMT lecture all right, and just give us a half dozen topics you'd be willing to speak on. I, I sent a list of things. And because I have co-authored some things with Dr. Thornton about skyscrapers, uh, I put in there, oh, I can talk about skyscrapers and business cycles. Uh, and I specifically said in there, right, if Dr. Thornton isn't planning to. right, so. I, I guess he wasn't planning to. I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I, it's fairly clear that I, I didn't like win this honor in a fight or something. I think he has a good foot on me. So I'm wondering if there's a skyscraper in business cycles like lecture height index that he can propose as well. I, I don't know. All right. So let's talk about the skyscraper index. Okay. So if you've not heard of this before, uh, the idea was first proposed by Andrew Lawrence back in 1999, uh, where he just made this kind of casual observation. Right. He said if you look throughout the 20th century. It looks like financial crises right, happen right around the time that record-breaking skyscrapers are being built. It's just one after another. Right? We see this pattern right? time after time again throughout the entire 20th century. It was a clear regularity. Now, he didn't really say much about this apart just kind of observing it. Um, there's actually some debate as to how serious he was about this, right? whether it was just kind of a joke index that he was suggesting, very much like the hemline index for skirts in the stock market, that kind of thing. Was this something that's kind of a joke? Or was it something that he was proposing would actually be something serious? Uh, but it was Dr. Thornton who came along a few years later and published a paper in 2005 in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, where he said, no, there's actually a very good right, theoretical reason for this to happen. Right? And we know that reason because of Austrian business cycle theory. Right? So I first uh, certainly need to describe that paper where Dr. Thornton makes these connections right, for us. Okay, so first let's get kind of the empirics out of the way, go through the list. Right, so go back to the early 20th century. We had two significant record-breaking buildings being built, uh, the Singer Building and the MetLife Building in New York. Right, they're both completed uh, 1908 and 1909. Right, so they were under construction amidst the panic of 1907. Right. Then we come forward a couple decades. Uh, 40 Wall Street, the Chrysler Building, the Empire State Building were completed in 1929, 1930, 1931. Right, so 1930, under construction as the stock market is crashing and we're entering the Great Depression. Right. Come forward a few more decades, we have the World Trade Center and the Sears Tower completed in 1972 and 1973, followed then by the 1970s stagflation. Right. And then we have the Petronas Tower in 1997, right, which is connected then with the East Asian crisis. Okay. Right. So one after another we see this happen. Now there is one false positive that Dr. Thorne talks about, and that is the Woolworth Building in 1913, which was not then followed by a financial crisis. Uh, he suggests, and I think there's good reason to believe this, that what would have been a financial crisis got covered up by World War I spending. Right? So we really didn't get to see that in the data in a clear way, like we did in every single other case right, throughout the 20th century. And so why would this happen? Right? It's an interesting observation, but why? So let's go back to Austrian business cycle theory. And Dr. Thornton describes for us three different Cantillon effects that come from lower interest rates that would then have an impact and encourage right, the building of skyscrapers. And so the first one is that a lower interest rate leads to higher land prices. It turns out there are a number of reasons this is true. Right? Now, so this is where I entered the picture. Right? This was a statement that Dr. Thornton made in his paper, and we accept this is true. And uh, so I did some research related to this. Kind of my, my research method is fairly predictable now for myself, and that I read things in the Austrian literature, I read things in the mainstream literature, I find where there's some overlap or connection, I get an idea, I write a couple pages about it, I send those pages off as a proposal to the, quarterly, to the um, Austrian Economics Research Conference they host here uh, every year. I, generally, it would get accepted. And then I put together a 20-minute presentation. I come and I talk about it. And then I forget about that paper and go move on to something else and never publish it. And that was exactly the, the history of this particular paper. Right? So I presented this idea. Dr. Thornton heard this and said, oh, OK. This is interesting. I'm glad to see that other people are interested in skyscrapers. So 
maybe there are things we can do together. So then we ended up, uh, we did actually publish some things jointly that I'll talk about here in a minute. So I'm gonna flesh out, right, what is a sentence in Thornton that takes me a couple pages and 20 minutes to say. Right? So, so here we go. So lower interest rates lead to higher land prices. So why does that happen? Right? So I suggest that there are three different reasons right, for this that all combine on top of each other right, and would specifically lead not, to, not just toward more building, but more building specifically of skyscrapers. Right? Right, so the, the first thing, Right, is when we have lower interest rates, we tend to discount the future less. Right? This is not that surprising. That's something that Dr. Herbner talked about in his lecture. Right, so imagine a piece of land. So just any piece of land, let's say that this is fairly raw land, might have, say, wild raspberries growing on it. So it is producing something, and it will continue to produce this over time. Right? So, so I think about the value of this land. Right? Well, from a human perspective, the way that I would value this is I'm really just interested in the raspberries. I like raspberries. They're great. Right? So I want the raspberries. Of course, most of the raspberries this land will produce are in the future. Right? So I will discount right, that future production and when I decide how valuable this land is to, to me when I want to buy it. Right? So if we have lower interest rates, I discount the future less. So all of this future production is less discounted, which then means the value of the land is going to be higher. Right? So this is something that is going to be true for any land that human beings are thinking about using. Right? As long as it has this future use, whether it's because it's holding a building or because it's producing corn or raspberries or what have you, right, we're going to value it more right, whenever we're discounting the future less, it's the promise of future services. Right? But there are also a couple other reasons. So one, and this is where I got an overlap with some of the mainstream literature regarding land use. Right? Right, so another thing that lower interest rates do right, is it increases wages. Right? So we know that um, Dr. Newman talked about this in his Austrian business cycle theory lecture, described how this would happen. Right, so we have an increase in wages. And one thing that does is it, it changes the way that we view the value of our time. Right? So that the time that we're spending not being paid, we tend to cut back on because there's a greater reward from being paid. Right? So one of the things that we will do and not be paid is commute. Commuting is not particularly a pleasant experience for me. I don't like it. Right? I don't want to do a whole lot of it. And if I'm having to give up high paid work time to do it, I really want to minimize that. Right? So is this commuting time right, is what's going to push us toward downtown. Okay. Right? So normally, like, and this, this happens just generally because we value time, what you're going to find is that residences that are located closer to places of work, people are going to be willing to pay more for that land. Right? So, because I want to be close to work. I want a short commute. Right? On the other hand, if I have to live you know, an hour away from where I work, I'm not going to be willing to pay as much for that land. Right? And this is something you can actually see when you look at land prices. Right? And you can also find evidence of this in the way that we build right, on the different land. Right? So just as an example, uh, look at how tall buildings are when you look at downtown right, versus outside of town. Right? So you go downtown, we stick huge buildings on tiny amounts of land. Right? So one way we can think of this is that the land itself is really expensive. Right? So we don't want to build out and use more land. Right? Instead, we build up. Right? We use that space above it, which is expensive to do. Right? Building the 10th story of a building is a hard feat. Right? But if the land next door is really expensive, it makes sense right, to go ahead and build that 10th story. Right? If land is really expensive, we build close together, we build very tall. Right? On the other hand, when land is very cheap, we build further apart, right? we may leave more green space between where we live and that sort of thing. So this is something you can easily observe, right? driving through any city, right? start in the outskirts, look at how close buildings are together, look at how big they are, move toward the downtown, and you find buildings get closer together and taller. Right? Uh, even if you live someplace like where I live, <laughs> I live in a very small town, we, we are up to multiple stoplights now. Yes. That's good, right? So, but if you look in Uniontown Square, right, right, Uniontown Square, it's not very big. We don't have, we don't have 10 story buildings, right? But we also have virtually no green space, right? Right around that is the first stoplight right, in the town. Right? No green space at all, right? Businesses are kind of in these storefronts like you might find in larger towns, right? Go you know, a block or two away, and now you start seeing, right, lots that are about a tenth of an acre or so, right, with a, a two, three story house on it. Right, built on it, also probably with a basement, so probably four levels, I would guess. Right? Go a little bit further out, now you start seeing a fifth of an acre lots being more common, and you might not see a usable attic anymore. Right? So now our houses are a little bit shorter in terms of usable space, but they're wider, longer, and so on. And then you go out where I live, right? I have a half acre lot. Right? I didn't pay an enormous amount of money, I don't have an enormous amount of money to pay for that extra land, and I have two usable stories in my house. Right? It's relatively shorter, even than just if I went a little bit further to downtown Uniontown. Right? 
things get shorter, we get spaced further apart. So this is the type of pattern we find. Right? So then what happens is we would find then that we'd have generally higher land prices right, in uh, the downtown area versus outside, but this gets intensified right, as we have higher wages make commutes even less attractive than normal. Right? So that would lead toward right, people tend to want to move away from the exurbs and suburbs, try to move closer to downtown, right? so people are leaving like the opposite of what they did last year, right? and trying to buy those high-rise condominiums, right? that kind of thing. That's where we're going to see people moving, and that's going to tend to drive up land prices as people are looking for shorter commute times. Right? So it's the second reason. So discounting and then uh, economizing on our commute times. Right? The third reason is just a simple income effect. Right? That generally speaking, the wealthier we are, right? the more living space we want to have. Right? So that would tend to increase kind of overall right, how much we're willing to pay for land. Right, so that would also push up uh, land prices on the whole. So two of these effects, discounting and the income effect, are going to push up all land prices, uh, but that, that commute avoidance effect is going to specifically push up prices of land downtown, pushing us then. We really want to build very, very tall buildings where we would normally build tall buildings anyway. Okay. okay. Build very, very tall buildings? That sounds like a skyscraper to me. Right, so that, that's an incentive for us to build skyscrapers, all because the interest rates were lower. But then Thornton gives two other reasons. And so we have this lower interest rate. One, we have this impact on land prices leading us to build up rather than out. But then we also have other things that happen. And so another is that a lower interest rate encourages us to engage in more capital intensive production. Right? Right, so we have more capital intensive production. And one of the effects of that right, is that there tends to be more economies of scale if you have a very capital intensive production structure. Right? So I think of, when I think of economies of scale, the, the example that I use in my class is the Kia plant right here on I-85. Right? Uh, as I noticed one time I was driving uh, from Atlanta here for one, for one of the conferences, uh, and I just looked over and said, that place is huge, it's an enormous plant, right? So I decided on the way back in my rental car, I was going to watch the odometer, right? and it's literally one mile right, from one end to the other. Right? I suggest it's not an accident, this is not in a downtown area, it's, it's a lot of space that they're using up, and there's nothing else nearby. Right? So they, they pick pretty cheap land. Right? But, so we have these economies of scale then leading to very large firms. So things like this Kia plant, when I presented this in class originally, I had a student come to me afterwards and say, oh, a mile-long plant, that's nothing. Or Henry Ford had a five-mile-long plant in Michigan. It's like, five miles? That's like half my commute. Right? I'd be driving past the same plant. Right? Right? So we, when we have these really capital-intensive, auto production is a great example of a capital-intensive industry that tends to lead to very, very large firms. Right? So if I have a very, very large firm, I need some place to put my offices. And these offices are probably going to be very large. It takes a lot of people right, to run something like the Ford Corporation or the Kia Corporation or the, li or the like. Right? So we need a lot of office space, ideally located close together. It makes meetings easier, that kind of thing. Right? So what kind of building is it right, that we're going to be able to have, say, in a centralized location so that people can fairly easily right, get to it? We can house all of these people in one space so we can facilitate meetings between different departments and what have you. What kind of building does that sound like? A skyscraper in a downtown area. This is a great thing for us to build. So the more we move toward having larger firms that then have to organize in this way, the more demand we're going to have for that downtown area to build skyscrapers. Uh, the third uh, effect would be when we have a lower interest rate, like Dr. Newman described, right, that does lead to more um, investment in the very early stages of production. Right, so often we like to focus on very physical things because it's easier for us to imagine. Right, so things like mining. Right? So we need to pull more ore out of the ground right, in production. But I'm very glad Dr. Newman mentioned right, there's also an intellectual side to this in research and development. Right? Before we can produce a product, we have to develop that product. Right? And it turns out building, especially record-breaking skyscrapers, so there's a big key there. If you're going to build a record-breaking skyscraper, you probably need to do some serious research and development to make it even technically possible. Right? Simply because if I'm going to build, say, a kilometer tall building, and I expect to be able to move people from the floor at the ground right, all the way up to the top, that's going to be quite an elevator. Right? In fact, we have nothing like this right, at this point. Right? So we need to develop. How do we make this happen without it being a painfully long ride right, from, from the bottom to the top so your commute is all vertical? Right? How do we make it fast enough, and, but also safe for people? Because this is actually a significant change in altitude. You're going through from 
the ground, sea level virtually, to a kilometer higher. So how do we make it safe for people? How do we also make it so that the mechanics don't take up an enormous amount of space within the building itself? Because any space that the mechanics um, from the elevator take is space that's very difficult to rent out, right? Nobody's really interested in renting the mechanic room, right? So we need to figure out how to do this, and that requires a lot of research and development. Uh, there are other cases where we have had to make significant strides in things like ventilation systems. Right? So how do we manage to actually heat and cool this building at all these different levels without dealing with say, air pressure problems and the like? Right? So it's very difficult, it turns out, for us to use say, a heating system like I have in my house when you build 100 stories on top of it. The furnace in the basement is not going to work very well. We need to come up with some other methods, and that requires research and development, which gets encouraged by that low interest rate. And so we have these three effects, right? land prices, capital intensity leading to larger firms, and then uh, the R&D, right? all combining right, to make record-breaking skyscrapers possible on the technological side, but also desirable at the same time. And so it's very, very powerful. And all of this comes from Austrian business cycle theory. Pretty cool. And so uh, Dr. Thornton published this paper uh, back in 2005. Right? And then uh, a group of economists right, noticed this paper, uh, led, it seems, by a man by the name of Jason Barr, right, who has written a lot about skyscrapers in the mainstream world. He has several papers on this topic. And it seems like most of his time was spent trying to figure out why we build skyscrapers. Why do we even bother with this? Is it a purely economic decision, right? Or is it something like we're, we're building skyscrapers for the sake of glory? Right? So we're competing with other cities and we want to build the tallest skyscraper to prove that you know, Chicago is the best or something like that. Okay. So he, he does a lot of these sorts of tests. And then apparently he came across this paper from Dr. Thornton and thought, well, something at least didn't feel right. Right, to Jason Barr with the research he had previously done. So he worked together with a couple other economists, uh, Misrock and Mundra, and they published a paper in 2014 in the journal uh, Applied Economics. Right? And the title of that paper was Skyscraper Height in the Business Cycle, Separating Myth from Reality. Right? So the title, you can get a sense of what they're going to be saying. Okay. All right, so what does he say in this paper? And I'm going to respond to it a little bit later, but first let's describe what he says. Right. So they really have two main uh, results, right? and these are econometric. I'll try to describe them as best I can. Right, so the first is that building height, like kind of average building height, does not Granger cause output changes. Right? Now, Granger cause is a weird word. Right? Why don't you just say cause? Right? And there's a reason for that. Right? What Granger cause is, it allows you to be very agnostic right, about actual causality. Instead, it's just about timing. Right? So, so when we say that height does not Granger cause output changes, well, what if it did? What would that actually look like? Right? So what it would look like if you did this test and you found, yes, there is Granger causality, what it means is that first we see buildings are getting bigger, right? so we have taller and taller buildings being built, and then after that, right, GDP starts increasing. Right? That would be height is causing, right, Granger causing right, output. So clearly, right, the skyscraper curse is, is not true. Of course, this is nothing like what Dr. Thornton claimed, or even going back to Andrew Lawrence, this is nothing like what he observed. He, he did not make any claim like this. Right? Right, okay. All right, so this, there's, there's no Granger causality, he found that. What he did find, though, right, was that height and output right, are co-integrated. Right? Okay. So Co-integration. Well, that's another very, very technical term. So what does this mean? Right? So we'll use co-integration tests to figure out right, whether two series over time, two data series over time, share some kind of common trend. Right? So are they moving right, predictably related to one another, basically simultaneously? Right? So probably the easiest kind of Granger, I don't know, the kind of co-integration test I can imagine uh, to tell you about. Suppose that you take uh, the returns of the S and P 500 over time, right? and then you want to compare it to the returns of the S and P 500 over time. No, I, I didn't just experience a brain blip. That was the same thing twice, right? So we're looking, okay, so we have this data set and the same data set. Let's check for co-integration. What we should find is that these are extremely strongly co-integrated, right? That you find exactly the same trend right, between these two. Right? But you can also do other things and run this test, right? So, for example, you could take the S&P 500 over time and then put a negative sign in front of it and run the co-integration test. And you also find out that they're extremely co-integrated. It's just that it has a sign of negative one. So, so one is the flip side of the other. And we can still catch that right, with the co-integration test. Or maybe we take the S&P 500 and then multiply it by a half. Right? Run the co-integration test again. Right? 
you'll still find, yes, they're co-integrated, but it's a factor of 0.5. Right? So, so it, can, it can deal with the fact you have different units or that kind of thing. We're just looking for, do we have some kind of simultaneity in the way these things move? So when we say that height and output are co-integrated, what does that mean? That means that as the economy improves, right, GDP is going up, buildings are getting taller and taller. Right? As the economy gets worse, right, height is falling, right? buildings are getting shorter and shorter, new construction. It's not that, not that buildings are shrinking, but the new buildings that we're building are smaller than they were before, which suggests then that at the peak right, of building height, we should be also at the peak of GDP. Right? Therefore, the skyscraper curse is a myth. I suggest that therefore is questionable, right? <laughs> this feels like the opposite conclusion to what we should come to, right? So, uh, so doc, this, uh, Dr. Thornton was aware of this paper, and this was right around the time that I wrote the paper and presented it at, at the Austrian Economics Research Conference. So he said, hey, this paper came out. Right? Let's take a, we can respond to this, right? So we wrote a, a fairly short comment uh, between the two of us and really just kind of recasting the results, saying this isn't actually conflicting at all with the story of the skyscraper curse, right? Like we don't have to reject the empirical work they did. It's perfectly fine. It just, the conclusion they draw from it, that therefore is totally wrong, right? The interpretation is wrong. So we wrote this short comment. We sent it uh, to Applied Econ, the place where the original uh, paper appeared. Right? Uh, and uh, they naturally sent it out, right, to uh, other academics to review, right? Uh, whether this was worth publishing. And we're reasonably confident that they sent it to Jason Barr. He effectively identified himself uh, in the, his comments on the comment. Uh, and the decision was made that no, this wasn't worth publishing in Applied Econ. So of course, we just gave up. On publishing in Applied Econ, let me finish, right? And instead, we said, well, okay, this is too short to publish anywhere else. We, we need to make this a full paper now, right? So uh, Dr. Thornton brings in his student, uh, Elizabeth Boyle, and the three of us together write a paper that gets published in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics the next year in 2015, entitled, Is There Such a Thing as a Skyscraper Curse? Right? And we obviously come to the conclusion that no, there isn't. Right? Yes, yes, there is, right? So, so what do we do in that paper? Right, so first we recast uh, the results from right, Barr and Company. Right, I'll tell you a little bit more about that, though I think I've already given some sense of where we're going with that. But then we also provide new empirical results. Right? So Austrians don't do empirics except when we do. Right? So, okay. All right, so these new empirical results, because ultimately this is an empirical question, right? Is there a skyscraper curse or not? Right? Does this actually happen? We know the reasoning is there, but can we observe it? So we did a couple things. So one was, uh, I just looked at, well, what is the probability of being in a recession in the United States, because I have that data fairly easily, right? if there was a record-breaking skyscraper built somewhere in the world right, the previous year, versus if there was not a skyscraper built in the previous year. Right? Is there any difference? Does the skyscraper building make any difference to our probability of being in a recession? Right? Right? So it turns out, if there was a skyscraper built in a particular calendar year, right, then the probability of us being in a recession in any, in any one month, right, I guess in any particular month is probably clearer, uh, the next year is 56.25%. Right? So if there's a skyscraper built somewhere in the world, a record-breaking skyscraper built right, somewhere in the world, then the next year, in any particular month, there's a more than 50-50% chance that you're going to actually be in a recession. Right? How does that compare to when there's not a record-breaking skyscraper? When there's not a record-breaking skyscraper built in the previous year, it's 23%. Right? Now, one would think that you could kind of eyeball 56% versus 23% and say, this feels like there's a difference. Like maybe the skyscraper is a sign, right, that there's a recession coming. Right, that that adds something to the information we would have without that. But just to be clear, I went through, I did all of the statistical work. See, is this a statistically significant difference? And yes, yes it is. Okay. This, it's not surprising. Okay. All right. But we went further. Right? So we can, in fact, run regressions. Right? So brushed off those skills, right? ran a regression. After all, because one of the issues we have is that uh, recessions, and also not recessions, right, tend to be pretty persistent. Right? So, whether I'm in a recession in January, right, I'm probably going to be in one if I was in December. Right? If I wasn't in December, I'm probably not going to be in one in January. Right? These tend to persist over time. We just have these turning points, and then it lasts a while, and then we have another turning point. Right? So, so what we were really looking for is kind of what happens with the turning points. Right? So in this uh, regression, it allowed us then to control for not just was there a skyscraper the previous year, but were we in a recession the previous month? 
Right? So controlling for that, what results do we get? Right, so here are a few probabilities for you. Right, so one, right, what is the probability of us being in a recession right, if in the previous month we were not in a recession and there was no skyscraper, no record-breaking skyscraper built in the previous year? Right? Turns out that's 2%. Right? Very unlikely that you're going to be in a recession in any particular year if you weren't in, a in, a, in any particular month, if you weren't already in a recession and also there was no skyscraper in the previous year. Right? What if instead we add a skyscraper to that? So what if, what's the probability of hitting a turning point where we go from things were fine last month, they're not fine anymore, we're in a recession now. Right? If there was a skyscraper built in the previous year, that goes from 2% up to 7%. Right? So that's three and a half times as high, right? hitting a turning point. And then this same, this same 7% chance, that feels really small. Remember that applies in every single month, right? At, at, at that entire year after we finish that skyscraper. Right, so we might not hit it immediately, but the odds of pulling that 7% chance at some point right, during those 12 months that follow is pretty high. Right? At, if we're going to do it at some point in that time. Okay. Right. How about going the other way? Right? So what's the probability of us not having a recession? Right? Well, if we were already in a recession in the previous month, and then what's the odds of us now getting out of it? If there was no skyscraper, it's 8%. Right? The odds of the recession ending, right, as long as there wasn't a skyscraper built in the previous year, Reasonable, right? 8% in any one uh, particular month. So give it a year, right? Odds are we'll probably get out of the recession. Right? On the other hand, if there was a skyscraper built the previous year, right, the odds of us getting out of that recession in any particular month right, is 3%. Right? So just slashed for the possibility of us hitting that turning point where things are going to get better. Right? Interesting. Okay. And yes, these are all statistically significant and all of that, right? So, okay. All right, so all to say, uh, we're of the opinion that there is actually pretty good evidence, right, that record-breaking skyscrapers, what the curse was about, not just overall building height, what the curse was about, record-breaking skyscrapers, are in fact connected with higher probabilities of entering recessions, staying in recessions, and so on. Okay, so let's get into just a, a couple more problems uh, then with uh, Barr and uh, et al. So a couple other observations about it. One was what I just kind of mentioned offhand, right? and that is that they looked at height on the whole, right? rather than looking specifically at record-breaking skyscrapers, which is, which is what the curse was about. Right? So, so they end up muddying the waters right, a bit with just general um, building. Right? Uh, a second thing is that when they looked at uh, what happens in terms of GDP, they were looking at output levels or GDP, not just at whether we're in a recession or not, right? which means how bad or how mild recession is, it's going to affect the results. As to like, does this actually look like it's appearing or not? Like, well, that's going to get muddied by how severe right, the recessions are, where the skyscraper curse is not actually making any kind of commitment to this at all, right? right? Whereas if I were to use the uh, Bar Mitzvah Mundra test, right, what it would mean is that higher buildings right, are going to lead to worse right, recessions for them to be able to catch it, right? We make no claim about this. We're not going to say, well, because the rec it turns out, this is a shocking fact, record-breaking skyscrapers keep getting taller. Because right? that's the way records work, all right? But this isn't necessarily true of financial crises, right? We can have recessions that are mild compared to the previous one or worse compared to the previous one. Right? That doesn't happen. So this is muddying the waters with the kinds of tests that they were using with Barr et al. Right? And this is making it so that, one, they're not even trying right, to evaluate the actual skyscraper curse and what it says. And two, even if we accepted they were, they're making it difficult right, to find right, based on just the simple data they're using. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to kind of take the traditional turn and say what happens after the 20th century. Right? So, so let's see what happens. And so first, I think it's worth noting that around the um, global financial crisis, we had the Burj Khalifa Tower was built right, right around that time frame. So that was uh, predicted it was predicted by Dr. Thornton as he noticed that it was being built. He said, yep, there's, there's a problem coming. He, he saw that coming for quite a while, and then sure enough, it did. So how about right now? Do we have any record-breaking uh, skyscrapers in the works? We do. Right? Uh, the Jeddah Tower, which is previously known as the Kingdom Tower, being built in Saudi Arabia, that's the one that's planned to be a kilometer tall. Now you notice I say planned to be. Right? Right, so let's talk a little bit about that tower. Right, so it turns out they started construction back in April 2013. So it's, it's a long process to build a kilometer tall building. Right? Right. Then February 2018, they finally felt like they could announce right, when the expected completion date was. 2020. Right? So now Dr. Thornton is one, he thinks that 
really the time we need to start looking is when they break the record, right? So when does this construction break the record? It might not be done yet. When does it break the record? But it turns out we don't have that signal because in March 2018, one month after they announced the expected completion date, they had to suspend construction because the, some of the Saudi Arabian purges created labor issues for them. Right? So they had to just abandon this. So we didn't actually get to the point where we could make that trigger, but it was because of a totally unrelated issue. It was just a political problem. Okay. All right. So nonetheless, we had this signal coming. 2020 was a year we should be paying attention. Isn't that interesting, right? Okay. Especially because I'm of, I'm of the opinion that when you look at the COVID crisis that we faced over the past year and the economics of it, right, the way that it fell apart doesn't feel like the way we would normally would think the crisis would happen in Austrian business cycle theory. Right? Normally, we wouldn't say, well, the way that the boom ends is that the government decides to just shut down a bunch of the economy. That's not normally what happens. We Get, we tell the interest rate story usually, right? That's that correction. And we're still waiting right, for that part of it, right? Okay, so we might still need to hold our breath a little bit longer, right? Although I do want to give right, some cautions and qualifications with my remaining time, although maybe not all of it, right? Okay, so one, we need to be careful not to take the skyscraper curse too literally, or it can lead us down kind of silly paths, right? For example, well, we have these record-breaking skyscrapers are causing, oops, right, are causing recessions. Zoning regulations. We never have to face another financial crisis, right? Just no buildings can be built over three stories tall, so we'll never have another record-breaking skyscraper built, right? We never have to deal with crises again, right? So. It does not take it that to that level of literalness. I, I, I know that uh, Dr. Thornton suggested, I don't, I've not seen this myself, that there was at least some uh, rumblings in China where they build a lot of skyscrapers. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that, that maybe they should consider right, stopping building all these skyscrapers because of the concern about causing a financial crisis on this sort of basis. So that, you know, that, that's missing right, what the story actually is. It's, it's a common cause, so you need to deal with that common cause if you want to prevent uh, the, the crisis from happening. Okay. So that's one thing. Right. I think it's also helpful, because right, we know occasionally we do get a false positive that comes along, right? so we have things like 1913. Right. Right, so I think it does, may be helpful, if you're using this for prediction purposes, to combine this with other indicators. Right. Right, so for example, the Jetta Tower it started being built in April 2013. We get the a crisis in 2020, right, when it was planned to be completed, well, they figured out the plan five years after they started. Right? Okay, that's, that's a long window. Right? So how can we narrow the window? Uh, I suggest looking at other indicators may help. Uh, one of my favorites is to look for inverted yield curves. Right? I think there's actually a good Austrian basis for this being a signal. Uh, if you ask most mainstream economists, I think they would also agree this seems to be fairly reliable most of the time, that an inverted yield curve tends to happen before recessions strike. Right? And I think we can understand this through Austrian business cycle theory. I'll spare you the details at the moment. And so we do that combination. So, so between Dr. Thornton and I, right, he, he watches the skyscrapers and, and I watch the yield curves. And right around 2018-2019, uh, the yield curve inverted. I said, OK, well, the recession is coming. It's coming. I, I didn't think it would happen through a global pandemic and lockdowns. right? But we have right, this uh, corroborating evidence right, that there is a problem coming. Another thing that can help Right, is to look for clusters of skyscraper buildings. So you notice when I gave the data before, right, very rarely was I just giving one building, right, except with the exception of the Petronas Tower. So it's Singer and MetLife, right, built right around the same time. 40 Wall Street, Chrysler Building, Empire State Building, all built around the same time. World Trade Center and the Sears Tower built around the same time. So these clusters do, in fact, help us to get an idea that it isn't, in fact, just one entrepreneur right, trying to, to gloriously show off their wealth. No, this is something that is embedded in the economy and the incentives that have been created, specifically by the low interest rates driving the boom. Right? And you can actually see this if you look kind of locally. And so uh, my wife and I, was it about um, maybe nine years ago now? No, it was five years ago, because it was for our ninth anniversary. Uh, we went and we took a, a I guess, a, a sightseeing tour on a, a boat right through uh, Pittsburgh. Right? So you go down the three rivers on the Gateway Clipper, and, and the tour guide was you know, over the loudspeaker talking about the different buildings and when they were built. Right? And I was listening, because right? you know, I had heard Dr. Thornton talk about this. Right? 
1929, this building was built. 1930, this building was built. 1931, this building was built. Well, isn't that interesting? Right? Right, so I just looked this up uh, when I was preparing this lecture, and, and there are very clear clusters in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, of building around the 19, early 1930s. Right? So that would be the onset of the Great Depression, the early 1950s, just before we had a recession. So it's, it's a more mild one, not, not a financial crisis that was huge, but we saw a cluster of building right around that time. Right? The early 1970s, very much the same time as the World Trade Center and the Sears Tower were being built. And then the early 1980s, we also had a back-to-back -back recession right around that point in time. And then 1987, it was another one, right? which is interesting because that caught a stock market crash that didn't lead weirdly, uh, to much of a recession until a few years later, right, in the early 90s. So I think that's kind of an interesting thing. Or then I looked because we happen to be close to Atlanta. So what, what about Atlanta? So Wikipedia is awesome, isn't it? Right. Like you can actually type in right, skyscrapers in Atlanta, Georgia, and there's a page. Right? And they list them out. And they list out the dates they were completed. Like, my life is so easy. Okay, so, so, so what they do, right, they set kind of an arbitrary cutoff, right? So here's some height, I forget what it was for Atlanta, they, they set some height, so, and there are 39 buildings that are taller, right, than this particular height. So I went through and I was looking for clusters, so I wanted, I wanted at least 10% of them, so, so let's say three or four buildings being built in the same year was what I was looking for. Turns out four of those 39 were built in 1992, right? That's when they were completed, so they would have happened then during the early 1990s recession, right, which, you probably don't remember one because you weren't born, and two because it was fairly mild, right? But okay. Uh, then uh, four more were built in 2008. Another three built in 2009. So these are all completion dates. They would have been being built right during the global financial crisis. Interesting. So, so 2008, 2009 total. It's seven right of the 39 tallest buildings in Atlanta being built. It's a fairly young city in terms of really attaining metropolitan sort of status in its building. Okay. So how about let's look worldwide. So there are, so again, right, tallest skyscrapers in the world on Wikipedia enter. They set an arbitrary cutoff for me. I'll accept that arbitrary cutoff. 74 tallest buildings in the world. I don't know why they picked these, right? But why not allow one more building? <laughs> the 75 tallest, right? Or, or the 40 tallest in Atlanta, whatever. Right, so the 74 tallest buildings in the world. So here's some, some statistics from those. Again, I was looking for, I want at least seven or eight, right, built in the same year. Well, the, the most common year to have a skyscraper built out on this list of 74, there were 12 of them completed in the same year. And that was 2020. Of those 12, seven were built in China. Interesting. Right. Now, it turns out we also have, that we have uh, apparently construction is underway. We have completion dates expected in 21 and 22 for three more buildings, right? uh, three more skyscrapers. Turns out of these three, uh, only three of them are in China. Right. Okay. And of those three, two of them are in the city of Wuhan. So I don't know whether there's some, some kind of skyscraper curse we can tie to the release of diseases. Right? <laughs> We're going to have to go back and do some epidemiological work or something that's outside my field. But I, I find that very interesting. That, like we, we know that COVID patient zero, whatever else you, you think about how this came about, we know COVID patient zero was there in Wuhan, China. Nobody debates this. Right? The same place that we're seeing a lot of the skyscraper building. I just found that interesting. So how about the other ones? So, so 12 completed in 2020, 10 completed in 2019. So of those 74 buildings, 22 right, were completed within the past two years. Right? So it would clearly be tied then right, with the COVID crisis. Right? And then uh, the last set was eight that were completed in 2012. That, that feels kind of strange. Right? Uh, but if you go back a little bit, you realize that these were buildings that took a while to build, and that would actually these would have come out of the global financial crisis as well. When you look at their building times, it did overlap there. Right, so, so I think that's kind of an interesting thing. So I think, this, if nothing else, right, it's a fun topic. It's potentially a useful topic. Uh, I, I myself, I'm not a very good investor. <laughs> so so, so I, don't, I don't rely on my intuition in looking at the skyscraper index to guide my investing. But it's nonetheless, I think, something worth keeping track of if you want to know where we're headed. Right? I think it's one thing amongst many that we should keep an eye on. So I'll go ahead and wrap there.